your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Print out or pull up those message outlines. It's available on the link, uh, on, the, on the YouTube link there, or we send them out via email. It's also on our website. Luke chapter 15, we are well into, a few months into our series in Luke, welcoming Jesus as perfect God and man. And this is a wonderful section, a little bit over halfway through Luke, as Jesus is traveling from the Galilee area, and he's heading toward Jerusalem. He's done a lot of teaching, a lot of miracles, people are responding, but Luke records a series of increasing rejection, but also a series of teaching as Jesus teaches about the kingdom and about salvation, about the gospel, as he heads toward the cross and the death and burial and resurrection, Jesus continues to teach. Many respond, some reject, and that rejection increases as he goes along. And so we're in that third section of Luke, roots, responses, then rejection, that section. And then reception is when he enters in Jerusalem, and then resurrection, the events surrounding um, the death, burial, and resurrection. And we kind of jumped ahead to that a few weeks back on Easter, and now we're back in Luke 15. So last time we accept Jesus' call to connection and to commitment. This time, Jesus starts interacting and he shares um, some wonderful stories, some parables, and easily one of the most famous ones in all the Bible. We're going to get to that one. But this is entitled, Sharing in God's Salvation Joy. And what does it mean to have joy and rejoice in the salvation, the mercy and grace that God offers to us uh, individually and also us and those around us and people around us, our family and friends, as they respond in faith to the gospel, that joy, that celebration that comes in as we were lost and now we're found and we receive Christ, we accept that forgiveness of sin. So let's look at it. Luke chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1, and reveal the joy of discovery. And so Jesus is talking, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So these are the unfavorable people from um, the society's perspective in Jesus' day. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law, so that's the lawyers and the Pharisees, sorry lawyers out there, I've said that before, but the self-righteous, on the one hand, the Pharisees and lawyers, and those that recognize their need, and the ones were elevated in society, and the others, not so much. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. So Jesus is telling these stories. He's interacting with people that need forgiveness and need repentance. He's not approving of their sin, but he's inviting them in. And he's sharing about who he is, and he's performing miracles. And they'll have opportunity to repent and to respond. So Jesus, with this contrast, he shares a parable. And I put on your eyes this. Seek out the lost and joyfully bring them home. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And so Jesus starts with a story that they'd understand. This is an agricultural society, and they would bring their sheep in for the, for the night into the fold for protection from wild animals. And if one's missing, any good shepherd would go out and find the stray, the lost, and bring that sheep back. And if they have, and if, if the shepherd happened to find the lost sheep, everybody would be happy, and the sheep would come home with him. And, and I love this story because it's about seeking out the lost and joyfully bringing them back home. But notice the contrast here with the joy of the lost sheep. But verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. So the lost sheep represents a sinner that repents and the shepherd, the good shepherd, welcomes him back, goes out and finds him, looks for him, and he brings him back home. There'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And Jesus is making a contrast between these Pharisees and these teachers of the law, the, 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 the lawyers there, 
sorry lawyers, and the tax collectors and the sinners. And the tax collectors and, and the sinners are the unrighteous. They're the sinful ones. They're the ones that are the lost sheep. And Jesus is the good shepherd. And he goes and he wants to find them and restore them and bring them back home. And he says, there's rejoicing in heaven when a lost sheep is found. But be careful because you 99 righteous. And he's speaking a little tongue in cheek because he's really saying you 99 self-righteous who you don't think that don't think you need to repent and don't think you need to respond and you don't think you need forgiveness there's no rejoicing in heaven over you because you're still lost <laughs> and so there's rejoicing in heaven when the lost are found but there's no rejoicing in heaven for the 99 that are self-righteous that think they are found already but in reality they are still lost and I put on your I put on your eyes this. Remember that the self righteous they just stay lost, and this kind of smug self contentment that sometimes we might have. I'm in. I'm doing the best job I can. I know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the, the the lost and the saving is for someone else. I don't need to be found because I have it pretty well together. Jesus says the rejoicing in heaven happens over the lost. That is found. And notice that the shepherd does that. And it's not just Jesus, the good shepherd, that does that. I think it's God's people. I think it's God's shepherds, you know, pastors and teachers and ministry leaders and, and people involved in, in, in growing the faith and developing people. Part of our role, and all Christians' role, is to seek out the lost and joyfully bring them in. And Jesus says, don't sit in your own self-contentment. Sometimes long-time Christians can be just kind of content and think, I'm in the fold, I'm in the church because I was good and I'm still good. And sometimes we might even miss out. We can grow up in the church and we can be a, a moral person and we can be a part of the right family. But there might come a point where we realize, you know what, I'm one of those 99 self-righteous lost. And sometimes we need to wake up to the fact that God wants us to shepherd people in and invite people in and reveal and release that joy of discovery. Isn't it exciting when you read a news report or you watch a, a video clip on, on TV or online about a child that was lost and everyone's fearful that they're, that they're gone and, and they're dead and then they're found alive and the rescuers are crying and the parents are, are crying and everybody is so happy because they've been found and they've been discovered. See, in a similar way, that's what Jesus is saying. We want to have joy in the lost that are found. Not just in our own life, but in the life of people around us. He goes on and shares another little short parable because he's making a point about lost and found, about the, the joy that is, real, that is real in discovering what was lost. He says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, and each coin that he's describing here is maybe about a day's wages. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Remember, homes back then, they weren't full of windows or anything. So you'd have to really kind of look around. It's dark in there. And then when she, so she, she's very diligent in looking at, man, I'm losing, I, I lost this coin. It's a value. I need to find it. And when she finds it, she calls your friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. And, and so Jesus, it's like he's telling a different story, but same point. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. So sometimes when Jesus shares a story, uh, he doesn't tell us exactly what he means. In these stories, he tells us exactly what he means. It's, it's a lost person. It's a sinner that needs to be found. A lost sheep, a lost coin. We need to find them. And when, when we found them, wow, what a blessing. And I put on your outline, to celebrate finding as God diligently seeks the lost. And I love this image here of this woman just looking and sweeping and, and looking in the nooks and crannies, trying to find this coin. That's what God does for us. He seeks us out. He wants to find us. And he is diligent in his efforts to seek and to save those who are lost. And so we celebrate when people are found and respond to the gospel. 
you know, we celebrate a lot of things, and some of those things we're missing now, uh, sporting events and big gatherings and, and graduation ceremonies. It's a really hard time for our people across the country and really around the world. And we're missing out on, on these celebrations and award ceremonies, and, and, and we feel that loss, and it's, very real, it's a very real loss. See, what we want to catch here is that there's this celebration, that there's this joy, that there's rejoicing when someone responds in faith to the gospel. It's like, hey, that's like receiving an Oscar. It's like receiving an Academy Award. It's like receiving, uh, you know, winning the lottery. Hey, don't do that, right? But it, it's, it's this beautiful image of celebration. See, do I partner in finding the way home? For the lost and, and do I have this sense of joy in discovery am I involved with the Good Shepherd Jesus and, and, and showing the way home for those who are lost do I partner with God am I involved with that God uses us as his witness and do I celebrate with God when someone responds in faith to the gospel that's two parables. There's one more. It's a little bit longer. It's easily one of the most famous uh, writings in ancient literature. The prodigal son and, and the lost son. And really, I think there's two lost sons. The younger son that leaves and the older son that stays home and is upset when the younger son comes back. But let's look at this together. And, and it starts with receiving the joy of repentance. So the first part, the first two parables, I think, were the joy of discovery. Something lost is now found. This is about the joy of repentance. And I put on your outlines this, starting in verse 11. Recognize our sinfulness and our need for rescue. So Jesus continues. He tells another story. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And that's kind of a rude thing to say. Because it's like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could get my money in advance. It's not really nice. So the father is compassionate, he's tender, so he divided his property between them. So he says, okay, here it is. Not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And we've, most of us have heard this story before. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this kind of jerk of a son says, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could get your money. Dad says, okay, here's the money. Off he goes, squanders it foolishly. And now he's hurting horribly, so much so that he's eating, you know, livestock food. When he came to his senses, right? And that's the turning point. Of the, <coughs> excuse me, it's the turning point of the story here. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Beginning at verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. See, in this story, the young man leaves foolishly, rudely, unkindly, rejects his family, rejects his dad, takes his money, he sets off, he, 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 he's, he's kind of worthless. We don't really like him in this story. He squanders his money. He falls on hard times, and then he thinks of Dad. He says, you know what? Even the, the, the servants at my old house, at Dad's place, ate better than I do now. While I come to my senses, I'm repenting, and I'm going to go back. And I put on your outlines this, recognize our sinfulness and our need for rescue. And this younger son recognizes, I need to repent and I need to return. And he does. And he hopes that his father will receive him back, not as a son, but as a servant, as someone that can at least live in the household. And I love this image of the son returning. And you notice he doesn't kind of get cleaned up. 
he doesn't turn he doesn't turn his life all around in advance he's going to throw himself on the mercy of his father right he can't fix everything all he knows is wow I can get food there and I am going to rely on my father's compassionate mercy even his grace when you think about it so he gets up and he goes to his father and folks we need to recognize our sinfulness and our need for rescue. You know, we don't clean ourselves up in advance before we respond in faith to the gospel. In fact, the Bible teaches that we can't clean ourselves up. We respond in faith to the gospel first, and we repent first, then God changes us from the inside out. We receive forgiveness of sins, and then God begins to do a work and changes us on the inside. Well, End of verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. So dad's going about his business. We don't really know how long the son's been gone. But often and regularly, he's watching and hoping and watching and hoping that will son return. Before he even gets home, he's running out to him. And, and he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He acknowledges his sinfulness and that he's not worthy. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Dad throws a party. I put on your outlines this. Enjoy and celebrate God's gracious acceptance and family joy. God wants us to repent and when we, re when we repent he welcomes us with open arms and he invites us in to feast and to celebrate and he invites us in to connect with him as his family. Do I admit do you admit, do I admit my need for, and do I receive the joy of personal repentance? See, this isn't just the story about the prodigal son, the lost son from the past. It's our story. We need to admit our sinfulness and repent and respond in faith to Jesus Christ and turn to him for forgiveness, for mercy, for acceptance, for inviting into his family. And we need that. And we can receive the real joy of that. And, and there's a frenzy in the household of excitement and celebration. Well, except somebody. And so, you know, we release, we receive this joy of repentance, but older brother, he's been around the whole time. He's doing his duty. In fact, we don't get the sense that in this banquet that he's around. And so he's off working in the fields and he comes across as very dutiful but very distant relationally and he's a little annoyed and ticked when he finds out what's happened. Meanwhile, verse 25, the older son was in the field and when he came near the house he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother, like older brothers often do with younger brothers, and but now he's directing it toward dad too. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. So you notice his anger isn't just directed toward the younger son, but it's directed towards dad now. And so instead of the intimacy of relationship, and instead of the understanding of repentance that the younger brother needed, and by the way, the older brother, there's this distance and this sense of obligation and duty. I'm earning my keep. I've been here sweating and working in, in, in the agricultural world, and I'm earning my way over and over and over and over. And, and he comes back and has done nothing. In fact, he rejected you, wished you were dead, and now he's back. How, how, how dare you welcome him back in? So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you 
and I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. I've been earning my way this whole time. I've been earning and earning and earning and earning and earning. So, Father, you should be indebted to me. See, there's two lost sons in this story. It's the one that ran away, but it's also this older one. Because he's captured by duty, right? And he, but, he, and he, but he's very distant relationally. He's not part of the banquet and the joy. He's distant from the Father. And he's caught in that duty cycle instead of receiving compassion and intimacy. Verse 30, But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat and fattened calf for him. Father, what are you doing? I put on your outlines this, you know, move past duty and distance to compassion and intimacy. See, God wants to experience the joy of forgiveness, not just in our own life, but in the life of somebody else as well. Somebody that doesn't deserve it, like we often look out there and see, wow, this person doesn't deserve it. How dare you forgive him? And what this older son is missing is he doesn't deserve it either. The younger son squandered in foolish, sinful living. The older son is squandered through duty and obligation and debt, and I got to earn, and I got to earn, I got to earn my way, into God. and then the father owes me, he owes me, he owes me. And he's missed out on intimacy of relationship with his own dad the whole time he's been there, and he's missed out on the compassion and mercy that dad wants to offer the older and the younger. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. You still have your inheritance, he says. I love you. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know, I put it on your outline. Celebrate God's compassion available to all. You know, if we flash forward to now, it's interesting that sometimes people that are longtime Christians have forgotten about the mercy that we need and the mercy we've received. And sometimes when we're longtime Christians, we can have this sense that, well, God picked me because I deserve it or because he needed me. And then we can be motivated by duty and we can be motivated by obligation. And God reminds us in this story, no, it's not about duty. And, it's, and we could end up being uh, very distant from the Lord, right? And our own Father, in, in the midst of busy, busy, and doing all these things, we can become more distant. We, we're all experiencing that relational distance now with social distancing, and it hurts us. We can do that spiritually as well. And the Father invites us into a compassionate relationship, in a relationship of intimacy that's founded on grace, for those that have been focusing on duty and those that have just gone out and lived foolishly. For those like in this story, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and those like uh, the tax collectors and the sinners. And see, Jesus wants all of us to respond and connect when we repent. And then he invites us into the banquet. He invites us in to relationship. See, uh, in red there on your outline's last key question, do I share in God's deliverance delight, right? Do I share in God's deliverance delight? Do I get a kick out of when God, re when, when God, re when people, someone responds to the gospel and, and God does wonderful things, not just in my own life, but in the life of somebody else? And, and do I move away from thinking, well, they just don't deserve it. Of course they don't deserve it. Neither do I and neither do you. And sometimes we can be angry and bitter like that older son. Sometimes we can be foolishly sinful and running away like that younger son. Regardless, the Father wants to welcome us in when we respond and we repent. And God will go to any length to seek out and save those who are lost. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and to die for me so we can have forgiveness of sins. That's the point Luke is making here. We have 
folks that serve over in Papua uh, and in Indonesia. And, and Tim and Mallory are over there. And if you've ever been over in Papua, uh, it's very mountainous and it's a very large island in the western half of the island. And there are people groups back in there that are only maybe three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred, maybe a thousand people. And a few thousands here and a few thousands there. And, and they speak uh, dozens of different languages in an area the size of um, Oregon and Washington and maybe a bit of Idaho. And dozens of dozens of languages and hard spot to get to in the world. And it's very inconvenient and it's very rugged. And just to even minister to the folks, you have to travel halfway around the world and, and fly into these small planes and build gravel airstrips and do all kinds of crazy things. And I've been there and seen what MAF and other groups do. And I'm reminded, and sometimes we think, well, it's not even worth it. There's so much here. I mean, we got, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic. There's so many things to do here. Why in the world would I care about a little tiny people group in the middle of Nowheresville in a place in the world that I'll never go to because it's so hard to get to and it's not high on my list? And then we look at these parables and we see to what lengths God himself will go to continually seek out the lost sheep, to seek out the coin, to seek out that older son and that younger son. God will do whatever it takes, and he calls us to have that same mindset as well, to share in this deliverance delight, and say, God, how are you going to use me? And now I'm speaking to those that already know Jesus. How are you going to use me? to expand out that, how am I going to be involved in seeking out the lost and saying, hey, come in, come home, come to the family, come into the banquet. You're here and you're listening and you say, wow, I, I'm not sure I know Jesus at all. Well, I invite you, I invite you in the name of Christ to receive, to stand up and be found and, and, and to repent and to receive forgiveness offered in Christ. And then we all get to share in the joy of salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these three parables. We're struck by them. And we're struck by the lengths that you've gone to to save us. And your son came to seek and to save that which was lost. That includes us. So whether we're new believers or whether we've been a follower of Christ for 60 years, we all need salvation and mercy. And you call us into, uh, through your compassion, you call us into intimacy of, of relationship. Where we're at the banquet, we're part of the family. And so God, help us as uh, longtime Christians not to become jaded and, and cynical. And Father, help those that are new in the faith, or still exploring, or maybe have just totally checked it. Help them to see a need for a Savior. Sometimes we need to even recognize that were lost in the first place. So between those two extremes and everything in between, Father, help us to experience that joy of repentance personally and in the lives of others. In Christ's name, amen. Remember, HCC family, I care about you. I love you. Let's stay connected and let's stay caring for each other. Uh, text me, email me, video chat, call. Um, anything I can do to help you, anything I can do to draw you into closer relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd love to be able to do that. And let's encourage each other as we do that together. God bless you.